Thank you for those words. They are very wonderful words from the words that Jesus spoken. And uh, before he went to the cross. And we are going to expound that verse, those verses as we proceed in the next uh, few weeks. And we are not going to study them all today because we have some cross-references to one of the verses. <clears throat> Thank God for uh, looking after me in the next few weeks. I did a lot of sleeping because I was not feeling well. But still, I still have my sore throat a little bit. <clears throat> this... Uh, Mucus uh, sometimes is itchy, but we see how we go. If I stop, you understand what I mean. So we have been doing uh, the series under the umbrella of God is Holy, and uh, series on sanctification, which is now part two, which is our holiness, and. Uh, and today we'll consider, and in the next few days or weeks, our one is in Christ. This is just part one. Our one is in Christ, and uh, we we'll look at more of that as we proceed. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. We we'll look at, uh, first of all, Holiness in history, because this word has been distorted in many ways uh, in history. How did the established church understand these things? If you look at the history of this word, it tells us that the word holiness was presented in many various ways. For example, the apostolic church, I mean the first century church, during the time of the apostles, they emphasized that holiness is conformity with Christ. One is in Christ. But the patristic church, when I say patristic church, those churches were founded by the great fathers of the church like Origen, Oranius, others, and others. Some of them gradually viewed holiness as a withdrawal from the contamination of the world. And when the church moved into the Middle Ages, the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Church the Byzantine Church, in other words, the perception of holiness has changed. Especially in the 11th century, in 1054, when the Catholic Church is split, and it became the Eastern Church, is what we call the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Greeks and other Eastern countries, that includes Russia, they are Orthodox, and then we have the Roman Catholic Church, and even the Roman Catholic Church split even before that time. So far as the location of uh, or a quarter of the religious uh, function. We call that in history the split of the Eastern Church and the Roman Catholic Church, the Great Schism. The great, the great split of the Eastern Church in 1054. And then... the church. That is for seeking secular approbation, secular merits, for seeking merits, worldly goods, 
and by extensively involving themselves in long prayer, fasting, and denying themselves about the things of this world. And excuse us. those who have achieved this level of holiness can be considered saints. Okay? So sainthood was not normal for all Christians. Only for those who separated themselves, the ascetics, from the world. This means they are only qualified for the nuns, for the priests, for the monks, as one Holiness was not, or sainthood was not for ordinary Christians. So what is the main issue of this religious system? Because they separated themselves, they talk more about their sins rather than the sin. Sins, which is plural, the sin, not plural, is the nature. They talk more about the sins that they have committed and they are going to commit rather than the nature of sin. They think too much of the sins rather than of their own nature. They think more of the wilderness rather than the problem of the human heart. Which Jeremiah said, the heart is the symbol of all things and this spiritually wicked. The core of the problem is the human heart, the na same nature. They forgot the teaching of Jesus Christ that we are in this world, huh? but we are not of this world. So the ascetic concept of holiness is very dangerous because they would miss the way of salvation it promotes the idea that salvation is by good works, not by grace. And that's the problem. For example, just one example, some of them, they live in a very high mountain, and they are still exist today, some of them. This is immature in Greece. That's not a nun, that's my wife. <laughs> and we went to some of these places. It's very interesting how people in the old days, some of those monastics in those days, they isolate themselves from society. To them, there's a form of holiness. Then there's another one, what we call mysticism. According to this belief, that holiness is not to be achieved by running away from society, but by rising above society. In other words, holiness can be achieved by uh, different levels, by climbing on a ladder, but with various stages in your spiritual growth. How is this achieved? By means of transcendental, transcendental meditation, by yoga, by illumination, uh, uh, by contemplation, and by emptying your mind which is demonic. When you empty your mind, that's when the devil comes in. Uh, that's, this is where many of the cults, false churches, comes in. Because they pretend that they are mysterious. There are things that are hidden about them. They will not tell the members about it. Just for example, the major, they have many sick. This kind of holiness is dangerous because they put feelings first rather than faith, rather than the truth of the word of God. The third one that developed in history and they thought this is the way to achieve holiness is what we call sacramentalism. And this is a belief which says 
that holiness is available to all automatically provided they are received they receive mass from the priest in other words the priest has the power to give this with some conditions they have seven sacraments in fact yeah baptism confirmation the eucharist reconciliation anointing of the sick matrimony and other holy orders we need to be careful again because this belief replaces the need for personal subjective work of the holy spirit in the hearts of the sinner it emphasizes ceremony it emphasizes ritual rather than personal faith in jesus christ and repentance of our sins you understand what i'm saying so we need to be careful about and that's how it develops in in, in history and there are many more and many of them today they exist in various forms based upon these three things that's why the reformation was indeed a big thing which took place in the 16th century like Martin Luther, John Calvin, Horace Swingley and uh, John Hart, John Knox, all of them tried to move away from the ascetic mystical sacramental ceremonies beyond holiness they want to go back to the biblical teaching of the holy scripture so it took them a lot of time because even after the 16th century uh, the renaissance came in history another problem you know that devil if there is something wonderful happening in the church that devil will put his own ideas to other people as well but even during the time of John Wesley there were many you know the word Methodists it came from the word Methods they were very methodical in their way of holiness it was a good thing they were students and yet because they were, they were methodical in their prayer and their fasting that's how the movement started which we call today Methodists it was good movement uh, but Methodists also have split in many forms there were many forms of Methodists throughout history and some of them emerged in the 20th century and the doctrine uh, of what we call perfectionism sinless perfection came as part of the protestant movement which is also wrong also wrong because if we say there is no such thing as there is no such thing perfect sinless perfection because john says in 1 8 first john 1 8 if we say we have no sin we deserve ourselves and the truth is not in us the truth is not in us you see as long as we are in this body this is what we believe as long as we are in this flesh in this body we continue to be tempted and sometimes fall into sin however as we grow in our lives we become more sensitive to sin and we will we are we are against sin of course and we draw closer to god as we grow and mature in the grace and knowledge of jesus christ so what is our standard then we might ask conformity with Christ. In other words, oneness with Christ. This is a higher standard than the Ten Commandments. In fact, the Ten Commandments says, just for example, thou shalt not commit adultery. Commit adultery. Alright? That's there that in the Old Testament that real adultery but in the New Testament, Jesus said, 
even just you think about it, don't even think about it, because if you think about it, you only commit adultery. Very high standard in the Ninth Testament than in the Old Testament. Thou shalt not commit murder, as an example. In the Old Testament, real murder. But in the New Testament, if don't say, I wish you dead, that's murder. Or I wish him dead, that's murder. Very high standard in the New Testament. That's why in the New Testament, holiness is conformity to Jesus Christ. To God the Father and to the Holy Spirit. We'll, we'll deal that as we proceed. So the Apostolic Church in the first century emphasizes holiness in conformity in the person of Jesus Christ. A life that is like Christ. Jesus said in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bear much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. This verse indicates to us a close relationship to Jesus Christ as believers in him. For without him, we cannot do anything. So there are three aspects here, but we are going to deal with one today. But I will mention that three. One is in Christ. He who abides in me. Like this to Christ, I in him. Fullness of Christ bear much fruit. We will look at one today. Then another part to in the following week. We will look at, at the last two in the next few weeks. One is in Christ through our positional sanctification. He who abides in me. We are positionally connected, linked in Jesus Christ. That word in, you might think is the smallest word in the Bible. It is the biggest word in the Bible. It's a tiny word, but it is really a big word. Normally, what we are in our Christian experience is very important to us. True? But it is better and more, more important to know where we are, not what we are. To know where we are determines what we are. This speaks of our position in Christ. We are, where we are determine what we are. We are in Christ. He who abides in me precedes I in him. The branch must be in the vine before it can bear fruit. So you ask yourself and I ask myself, where am I today in my relationship with Christ? Similar verses support this idea of what we call positional sanctification. This took place where we will, this took place when we first believe. This is our status in other words. Is given to us by, uh, by the act of God's grace. Right? It is by God's grace. Because of what Christ did for us on the cross. So the New Testament teaches that every believer is sanctified by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. That's our position. Legally, we call it also justification. That is our legal is standing before God. He declares us righteous. And on that day when we were justified, we were also sanctified. 
simultaneously. We will also sanctify. And we will go to the process of sanctification as we proceed in the next few weeks. Look at verse 10. This is our position in Christ of Hebrews chapter 10. It says here, and by, what, and by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and many, many times for all. We are sanctified. One Corinthians it says, but by him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Christ our sanctification. Is it not working on it? No, it's okay. Then in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 and 26, it says there, Husband, love your wife just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. The living church, the church of Jesus Christ today, is sanctified. It is clear that the status or the position of every believer and the body of Jesus Christ is sanctified in Christ. Even though his character, our character, is not yet perfect in holiness. But we are heading toward that. Holiness is our goal in other words. But in the sight of the Father, this is big doctrine, but in the sight of God the Father, you are holy. You are righteous. Not because of your own righteousness, but because of the righteousness and holiness of Jesus Christ. So let us bear in mind that despite of our sanctified status and position, the true Christian has not yet arrived, has not yet arrived as only sanctified condition while living upon the earth. But that is our goal. That's why Apostle Paul and Moses, widow, he was the author of Hebrews. I reckon he was, but some may disagree. This is what it said. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. In the English Standard Version, it says, Strive for peace with everyone and for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. In, other, in another translation, it says, Work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. And Paul gave us an illustration in his own life when he said to the Philippian church, Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I praise all to take, the, to take hold of that which for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. He said, Brother and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I praise toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me, even what in Christ Jesus. So that is our goal. That is our goal. Sanctification in full, according to the New Testament teaching, is something to be accomplished. The work has begun when he put us in that position, according to Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this, that he, be, that he began a good work in you. It began when you got saved. He put you there. He will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. And I like Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. Sometimes this is hard to understand. 
and God raised up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. He raised us and made us sit in. This is that indicates, it is in the past tense, that indicates this is the result of our salvation. And we sit together with him in the heavenly realm where he reigns. It's hard for us to comprehend that at the moment. But spiritually, that's our position. We are sitting with him in the heavenly realm. So true believers in Jesus Christ, sanctification, sanctification is, is something we have in Christ before God and something we must strive for in the strength, not our own strength, in the strength of Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. So, through Christ, we are made holy in our standing for God, and through Christ, we are called to reflect that standing by being holy in our daily life. So, what are the names to pursue? How shall we focus? Well, here it is. Three things to focus on. First, it has focus to the character of God the Father. Because as we continue our journey in our Christian life, it is easy to be distracted by this world. So focus to God the Father. We have heard before in our series these words again and again, Holy for I am. We conform to the character of God simply because He is the source of love. For God so loved the world. He is the source of compassion. He is righteous, holy, and He has integrity. Through the Holy Spirit, we try to think of God through His Word, through His Word, via His Word, and live and act as God would have us to act, according to the teaching of His Word. Conformity to the Father. Second, which we, I will develop more in the next few weeks, conformity to the image of Christ. We know that it is impossible to be holy apart from the strength of Christ. Because we are all, as Isaiah said, we all our righteousness are just as spiritual rights. Conformity to Christ is not a condition we have to abide in order to be saved, but it is conformity to Christ. We have to do it because we are already saved. John Calvin said these beautiful words is in the newsletter. Set Christ before you as the mirror of sanctification and say grace to mirror him in his image as in its situation encounter what would Christ think see and do and then trust him for holiness and he will not disappoint you when I was in the Bible college we have a subject for the more Christian ethics or going try to distinguish what is right and wrong. And sometimes there are things in life as a Christian, it's very hard to distinguish what is right and wrong. Black and white. And sometimes they are very gray in our thinking. So we were asked these questions. And Joel Beck asked the same question. He said, does, if I do this thing, does this glorify God? Because we are born in the Bible, so whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. If I do these things, will it glorify God? Second question, is this consistent with the Lordship of Jesus Christ? You were born at a price. Do not be slaves of man. Christ is the Lord of your life. If I do these things, is this consistent with the Lordship 
of Jesus Christ. It is my Lord. If I don't understand. Second question. This is consistent with biblical example. Follow my example, the Apostle Paul said, as I follow, as I follow the example of Christ. Third question. If you are making decisions in life, is this lawful and beneficial for me? Spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically? Is it beneficial for me? Is it? This is what the Bible says. Do you not know that wrong doors will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men. Homosexual. No thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkard, nor slander, nor spindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Very strong words, powerful words. And Paul said to the Corinthian church, this was your life. That is what some of you were. This was your life, some of you. But now, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Amen. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything. Is that not what people say? I live in a free country. I can do anything I want. The question, is it beneficial? Is it for the glory of God? Will it benefit you emotionally, physically, intellectually? But I will not be master of anything. Last question. Oh, another one. Before the last. Does this help other possibly? And not hurt others unnecessarily? Even as I try to place everyone in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that what, so that they may be saved. That it help, does it help others if I do these things, if I make decisions like this? And lastly, does this bring me under my sleeping power? Paul said, I have the right to do anything. He said, he said to them, but everything is beneficial. You see, everything is beneficial. I'm repeating the one. But I have the right to do anything, but I will not be master of anything. But there is a verse that I missed in chapter 8, verse 13. Because I'm tying him together. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will not eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. You see, in the market in those days, in episodes in current anywhere, before they sell the meat in the market, they offer them to God. portion of the meat is given to God and some of the leftover are being sold in the market. And there are those Christians because they know they came out from paganism, they will not eat meat sold in the market because they have been offered to God. Paul said there is nothing wrong eating meat but you buy meat in the market over to the others. There's nothing wrong because they have been sanctified if you pray about it. But if my brother and my sister will get stumbled by me buying and eating that meat, I will refrain from doing it. That's a principle. 
For example, is there, if there is a kind of movie, so far as I'm concerned, there's nothing wrong with it, but if my brother will stumble because I watched that movie, if he gets stumbled by me watching that movie, I will not watch that movie. As my professor in the seminar said, I eat dinoguan, blood pudding, but if my brother will get stumbled, I will not eat blood pudding. It's a principle. There's nothing right, so far I'm concerned, but if my brother gets stumbled, I will refrain from it. So these questions I gave you, maybe I have to put this in the newsletter so you'll have it next week. When you're making decisions, they are very important. Moses had the right attitude. So believers in Jesus Christ should live a present tense, in other words, in the present tense, total commitment to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We should not be trapped by one moment of pleasure. Eh? I know a guy who used to come to this church, but they left only maybe 16 years ago. He's a good looking guy, but many girls like him because of his, doing, of his job. One night, he had a one night stand with one girl. But he's married with two kids. And for six months, my wife and I were giving them counseling because the following morning he confessed to his wife and he confessed to his father-in-law that he did this last night to this girl. He was so guilty that he even confessed to his father-in-law, which was good. And he likes to uh, uh, retain and hold his marriage in spite of the things that he did the people. One moment of pleasure. So we were counseling him every week for six months. And they are still together today after 70 years. Praise God. And they are both serving the Lord, husband and wife, in uh, somewhere. Uh, hey, I will not kill him. In my free research, I will not kill him. <laughs> I am not mentioning name, but I know. So one, we must have the attitude of uh, Moses in Hebrews. It says here, by faith, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. This is what I like to emphasize. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God. Rather what? To enjoy the fleeting grip Places of sin. Sin is pleasurable only for a moment. Secondly, conformity to the Spirit. Then we're close. Huh? I'm in a hurry now because uh, oh, it's still early. Conformity to the mind of the Spirit. One of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is to conform our mind to His mind. You understand? <coughs> because our mind is a polluted mind. Our mind, even when we pray, it wanders away. Everywhere. True? One of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is to conform our mind to the mind of the Spirit. And in doing that, we are conformed to the image of the Father and to Jesus Christ. Because the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to exalt Jesus Christ all over. So how does the Spirit do that in our lives? First, the Holy Spirit will show us of our needs of our sin. 
Jesus Christ said before he went to heaven, before to the even before the cross, he said, when he comes, referring to the Holy Spirit, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and justice. The word convict in the other translation has two meanings. One is the one they use in the court of law when someone is sentenced because of conviction. And the other one is the word convincing. The Holy, it is the one that is applied to us in this verse. The Holy Spirit will convince us of our sin. Bring conviction of our need of our Savior as well. And He does that to us. Secondly, the Holy Spirit imparts to us the desire for holiness. It is the Holy Spirit that will prompt into our thinking, into our hearts, a desire to live a holy life. Because of what Christ has already done for us. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit provides to us the strength to live a holy life. We need the Holy Spirit all the time. We need to be filled by the Spirit of God all the time in our life. Because you were already baptized by the Spirit of God into the body of Jesus Christ once when you believe. But you need to be filled again and again by the Spirit of God. You need the strength and power of the Holy Spirit to live the Christian life. That's why Galatians says 5.16, For I seek to walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify. If you walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desire of the whole nature of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit means to live in obedience to and dependence on the Spirit of God. That's what it means. Fourthly, through constant feeding of God's Word, in our life. Because the Bible that we have, the author of this book is the Holy Spirit. We need the Word of God, we need the Holy Spirit of God. They are all essential for a worthy God and they are essential to help us to walk in holiness. Apply the Word of God. It says here, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and long suffering. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Really, this is the character of God. The character of the Son. The character of the Holy Spirit. If we have that, we begin to grow in the holiness that God has called us. So Christ is in all. Christ is all and ever. And in all, that includes your sanctification, my sanctification. That includes your holiness and my holiness. Christ is all and in all. So we'll continue to proceed on this study on oneness with Christ in the area of sanctification in the next few weeks. I'm excited every time I study, a lot of things come to my mind and I get excited. Uh, in fact, this sermon is very long. I cut it out. So today is not really that long, is it? Because when I get excited, I cannot stop uh, typing. You know? I, I just love it. I love it. You know? And when the Holy Spirit excites you to study and uh, the build of a sermon, just sometimes little phrase it becomes big and big and big. And uh, I thank the Lord for His help all the time. In spite of the fact that uh, sometimes I have headache, 
and uh, I get out of the study, then I get a drink, rest for, lie down in the recliner for 20 minutes, then I go back again to my study, then I cannot study for more than four hours without standing, because otherwise I got headache, then I go back again. My study, I give you my routine back. Uh, I study, I get a drink, I rest, I go back to my study. Uh, I have to balance my, my brain because of my, my problem. But thank the Lord is helping me in that way. I, I have learned to live what I mean because of my current corona, but not corona. <laughs> uh, Cabernoma, very similar Cabernoma problem. I have to learn to live with it. You know what I mean? This headache. I have to learn to live with it. And I have learned the secret of living with it. Uh, that involves uh, a lot of things uh, at home. So I thank the Lord for helping me in that way, learning few skills in different ways to avoid uh, uh, migraine. So thank you for your prayer as well as the church and uh, for your help. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word and the blessing that we receive every day. Little things we enjoy, and we thank you for teaching us uh, about who you are, Father, uh, who you are, the Lord Jesus Christ, and who you are, Holy Spirit. Thank you for teaching us to, to be conformed, to live a life that pleases you. Thank you, Father, for the joy of following you all the time in obedience. Thank you for your people today. Bless them. They are here to love you, to express the devotion, the love for you. And those who are at home and everywhere, bless them as well. May the joy of the Lord be the strength of today. In Jesus' name, amen.